Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. This year, Indiana is celebrating 200 years of tradition and building Hoosier pride for future generations. Meet the Indiana residents transforming our state. Discover an Indiana artisan that memorializes history for the U.S. Mint. Explore the Jones Dairy Farm where function fuels the future. Journey to Rossville in another little Indiana adventure. And welcome Indianapolis folk favorite Bigfoot Yancey to the studio. From honoring history to transforming it, you don't want to miss this episode. It's all coming up right now on the weekly special. Hello, I'm Daryl Neer. And I'm Erica Sagone. Well, Erica, it is May, and there is no Indiana tradition more visible than the Indianapolis 500. That's right. It's the 100th running, and it's all anybody is talking about. But of course, there are lesser known Hoosier traditions that have had a big influence on our state, and we're going to share some of those stories with you right now. Our first story is about an extraordinary Indiana artisan whose miniature art is having monumental impact. <music> I'm Donna Weaver and I'm a sculptor designer. My first memory of sculpting something is with my mother sculpting snakes. Very simple for a three-year-old to do. You roll it on the table and you can coil it. And you put little eyes, yeah, sculpting snakes. I like making stuff with my hands. What I enjoy most, I guess, is whatever the job is at hand but I do like sculpting wax. I like sculpting clay, putting it into plaster, casting. I like designing. I like pulling things together and making them work together. Sometimes the most challenging thing is the limitation of the, the medium you're working in. If I'm working in wax, I know what my limitations are. If they're doing a portrait, I have to compact that person, squeeze them down, and yet I have to make you believe that it's a real person. I enjoy history a lot. And so I use history a lot in what I do, in, in the jobs I do for the U.S. Mint as an outside artist designer. Do you have my artwork in your pocket? When you're working on a project like designing for the Indiana Bicentennial, uh, the task was to take 200 years of Indiana history and compact it down to what initially would be a three inch diameter metal. 200 years is a long time. So I went to history books, just basic history books to see what they thought was the most important. Picked out a few things there, then I added some ideas that I thought were important. Trying to make things work design-wise as well as history-wise and satisfy different elements of the population also. Sometimes my work is selected to be on the gold medals that are presented to, to groups that are honored by, by Congress. And I've been to some of the ceremonies. The last one I went to was honoring the foot soldiers of Selma. Um, and it was really wonderful designing for that because it's a meaningful thing, it's important. And to be at the ceremony, watching the presentation, somebody asked the people in the audience to stand up if they had been at Selma during the march, and about 50 or 60 people stood up. It was just wonderful to see them. It was really exciting to be in the same room with people that had done that, that put their lives on the line to do that. And that's a kick. I don't like to trivialize it as a kick, but it was an honor for me to be there. You're learning history from the inside out and through the through the works of other people and through your own work. The most satisfying thing is uh, when I finish a job, taking a brief look back at it and saying, that wasn't so bad, or coming back to it a few weeks later and say, not too bad. That's, that's it.
You can see an entire gallery of Donna's incredible work at waxportraits.com. And of course, visit indianaartisan.org to find more Hoosier artists in your area. Erica, I think that the legacy of Donna's work is, is quite incre incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And her design was chosen from 100 submissions. And her past design credits include state quarters for Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Well, while Donna Weaver is memorializing history for future generations, our next subjects are transcending tradition in unexpected ways. Star City, Indiana. It's a fitting name for the unlikely home to some of the state's most famous residents. Each year, hundreds truck from around the country to see them. No, not them. Them. That's right. The 140 cows that reside at this fourth generation dairy farm. I've always in, enjoyed the farming. I remember uh, we had a tour of some uh, children from Marshall and Fulton County, and they were here, and I said, when I was a child, I used to play in the yard down there in my sand pile with tractors and trucks, and, and the only thing that's changed is the size of my toys. I just use bigger toys now to do the same thing I've always wanted to do, and that was farm. For Sam, dairy farming is in his blood. His grandfather started the farm in 1919, and in 1956, his father built their first milking parlor. But when Sam took over, his focus wasn't on where the cows were milked, but how the cows were milked. There was an article in a farm magazine about robots being put in use over at Europe. And my wife, Pam, said that uh, I, I made a comment that, boy, someday I'd like to own some of those. The three times a day milking was the major thing back then. If you milk a cow three times a day over twice a day, you'll increase your milk production by 10 to 14 percent with no other forces being uh, implemented. But the labor is a real issue with that. With robots, they do it 24 hours a day and it eliminates the labor problem. I don't know why, it just made so much sense to me. I call ourselves cowologists. It's about what the cow is thinking and wanting. I know that's, that seems silly, but it's really what the cow wants to do. It's totally up to her. Robotic milkers became available in the Netherlands in 1992, but it took another eight years for them to be introduced in the U.S. When the Jones installed their robots in 2003, they were one of only 10 robotic dairies in the nation. Um, they actually interviewed us before they said we could buy the robots to make sure we were robot material. We would understand and be able to learn all of this. Um, and after they did that quick interview and, and came and visited our facility and spoke with us, they said, well, yeah, you will work well. They basically said, we're going to train the cows first and then we'll teach you. And so the cows learned how to do the robot thing and we kind of stepped back and watched and helped in the process. And it did take some cows a little longer than others and some took off and learned it first time through. And it's still that way, even we have a new mama that just calves and we're bringing her up for the very first time and introducing her to the robot. It takes a little while, it's just their personality. And just like a personal signature, each cow provides unique milk characteristics that the robot can record and track. The cow steps onto the robot and it's ID. And each cow has a electronic ID tag that's also the activity tag. So if she's ID'd and it says she needs to be milked, the robot arm will proceed to stimulate and clean her teats uh, each quarter. And the robot tracks color of milk. It does a conductivity test on the milk. If milk is abnormal due to being in heat or the cow is sick or along those lines, the robot gets a reading and alerts us to check this cow for what might be wrong with her. It lets us treat our cows before they, the infection really gets a hold of the cow, so it takes less antibiotics. It just gives you a wealth of information to make the animal more healthy and hopefully help other farmers too. Each year the Jones provide hundreds of tours, 
not just to local school children, but also to fellow dairy farmers, hoping to raise awareness about the benefits, especially for small farms, where the introduction of robots can dramatically improve lifestyle, increasing family time without decreasing livelihood. My dad used to be uh, really happy if we would ship a million pounds a year. This year we're on uh, goal to almost ship three million pounds of milk on pretty much the same amount of land for the dairy. The stress on the animal is so much less. There's no waiting uncomfortable, can't sleep, can't lay down. The robots are always open. The happy mood of the herd caused an unexpected change. No moo in the herd. We don't hear a lot of mooing on our farm. It was hard to get used to because the cows mooed a lot when we milked the other way. Wanting to be fed, wanting maybe to lay down and we had them in the holding area. And we didn't really realize that until we got the robots and we heard no mooing one day and we actually called a professor at Purdue and asked, you know, our cows don't moo anymore. And he said, well, they don't want for anything. They really do like the laid back approach of letting them pick and choose when they want to eat, letting them choose when they want to lie down. If they want to stand out in the cow lot in, in the rain, um, they can. If they want to stand out in the sunshine, they do. I've seen cows licking icicles off the barn. They're almost like kids. That's the part I enjoy the most about the cows is actually seeing their unique personality. I've always had a connection with animals. I really have a, a degree in radiology, but I quit the day before we got married to become a dairy farmer, and that was 37 years ago, and I wouldn't change that for anything. To learn how you can take a tour of the robotic dairy farm yourself, visit their Facebook page for contact information and directions. Well, Daryl, did you know that Jones was the first robotic dairy farm in Indiana, and now there are 11, so... People are, must be catching on to it. Quickly. <laughs> well, it just goes to show you that you'll never know what you'll find in a small town. And Jessica Nunemaker is here to share her latest Little Indiana adventure. The town of Rossville is truly a place where you can feel at home. The town motto says it all. There's a lot to see in this small town. Got fabric? You will love Rossville Quilt. This is a very spacious, clean, bright, and well-organized shop. Bolts of fabric in all styles run the length of the walls, as well as shelves throughout. Workshop space with wonderfully cushy chairs let folks linger over projects in the company of friends. All the sewing essentials are here, including the machines. When you see a small sign reading bakery with an arrow pointing down a country road, Follow it. Each morning, 50 types of donuts are available. Though I admit it is hard to think donuts when there are also cookies, breads, and pastries. Bulk foods and refrigerated items are also available. The cream horns are particularly fabulous. Tacos, tacos, tacos. Dan the Man's taco stand feels like you've somehow transported out of Indiana and into a warmer, palm tree growing kind of state because of its ongoing beach theme. A wooden walkway runs the length of the shop. Large murals feature images of sand and sea, and you can grab an ice cream cone at the Tiki Hut. Huge appetites can tackle Dan the Man's food challenge. Gobble up a large cheese fry, three beach tacos, or try the 16-ounce cheese-covered fries topped pork tenderloin sandwich and wash it down with a 16-ounce drink in 30 minutes or less and get it for free. Your picture will then be added to the real men wall. For the rest of us, take your time and enjoy a taco or the hand-breaded pork tenderloin sandwich with a side of the best fries in town. Teresa's Restaurant and Lounge is a longtime fixture of downtown Rossville. Big Burgers, Catfish, and the Prime Rib are a few local favorites. Since it is a bar and grill, a full wine and beer list is available. Be sure to try the crispy onion sticks. This town of just over 1,600 people is so friendly and comfortable, you might just decide to stay. Find out more about Rossville, Indiana on www.littleindiana.com. 
small towns, destinations, not drive throughs I'm Jessica Needemaker, and this is Little Indiana. Well, Daryl, good news. I have enrolled you in Dan the Man Food Challenge. Good luck. Thank you. I can get on the man wall then. <laughs> well, our next guests are making quite an imprint on the musical scene. Meet Bigfoot Yancey. I've been playing music about 12 years, off and on, of course. After 2009, I really picked it up. I had an accident with a table saw and lost some fingertips. But I bounced back from that very quickly with the support of my friends. I started writing songs again and playing around fires with some of the current members of Bigfoot Yancey and we got acquainted with each other. And then here we are now. We formed this band oh, about two years ago, 2014. I was kind of living in my van, traveling the country with my dog, spending a lot of time in the desert. I passed this exit on the way to Laredo, Texas, and it, it said Bigfoot Yancey. I was like, that's a great band name. And I called the guys, I was like, well, let's start a band. And they're like, okay. And then a year later, we're having our album release. Jaron Kelly plays lead guitar and harmonica and sings backup. Lauren Bohall plays banjo, mandolin, and the saw, and also sings. And Kevin Grove is our upright bass player and a backup singer. So we try to invoke four-part harmonies as much as we can. We're such a broad diversity of background influences. It's like grunge to jazz, blues, everything is in there. So we just come together and just do what we do. I couldn't really describe it any better than that. Hold just a little while. Some of the most important things I've learned about the music industry thus far are there's a lot of genre barriers. You don't see like folk bands playing with psychedelic bands and things like that. And we're friends with all different kinds of genres of bands and there doesn't have to be this futility. We're trying to break down walls. That's what we do. I feel successful in what we're doing now because we get to travel around. We get to meet new people and play awesome places. It's great being around these new people. They feed us, they take us in. We get to learn their story, we tell them our story. It inspires us to keep doing this. So even if we're not making a million dollars or winning Grammys, which we hope to do one day, it's still fun for us and we feel successful. What drives me as an artist is, it's just fun to be with my friends and play music and just meet new people all the time and be in front of people and inspire people. To see kids dancing in front of our stage or grandmothers, it's like such a broad range of people that are attracted to our music, which I'm so thankful for because most bands have a very niche market and we attract everybody. I think it would be nice if music took us around the world. We don't have to be billionaires, but just to travel and do what we do and have fun together. I don't know how it is for other bands, but for us it's been great. It's a fun road and I can't wait to see how far it goes. It's really about just following your dreams and being happy. And now, Bigfoot Yancey. One, two, I want you ready to go.
You guys are so fun. <laughs> well, to get all the latest updates on upcoming performances and new music releases, visit BigfootYancey.com. Now we have to take a minute to talk about a very cool music event that you guys have launched in Indianapolis. It's called the Virginia Avenue Folk Festival and it's happening this weekend. Mike, tell That's us right. a little bit about it. So last year we were just sitting around at the coffee shop eating donuts and we decided we need to start a music festival. So here we are in our second year. This huh. year we're having uh, 100 performances across 13 stages. Wow, all in one day. All in one day, spanning that's... almost a mile. Wow, that's incredible. What made you want to start a music fest? <laughs> I don't know, I want to do a lot of things. <laughs> well, of course, Bigfoot Yancey is going to be one of the acts there. They're on at 7.30 on Saturday night. And many former weekly special musical guests will be there, including Sweet Poison Victim, Whipstitch Sallies, White Lightning Boys, and many more. You don't want to miss it. Get the full lineup, including performance schedules and stage locations at virginiaavenuefolkfest.com. Well, Erica, that's all the time we have for this evening. But before we head out, let's hear one more time from Bigfoot Yancey.
Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 